This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. We're here to entertain you, we'll sing your songs, for good times, the best times, you can't go wrong, we'll two-step, a new step, it won't be long, when the Dixieland's are playing, soon you'll be swaying, so come on, sing along. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Before My Time. I am your host, Kelsey Laurie, and we are joined, as always, by our beautiful friend and producer, and let's face it, co-host, Matt Kelly. And we're going to talk about the history and beginning of pinup girls. Where did they come from? This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. It is mind-blowing. And heartbreaking. How many original scripts are written every year but are never made? So we seek out these scripts and bring them to life with full audio production and professional actors. Check us out at Undiscover Scripts. Movies made of paper. Wherever you get your podcasts. Free! So, Gelsey, I am shocked that it took us this long to talk about something that is so firmly established as part of your personality uh, but we're going to talk about the history of pinup models. Yes, we are. And that is, I have a whole pinup alter ego. I do a lot of pinup modeling myself and own a lot of pinup art. So I'm, I am a little shocked too. I feel like we're in that phase now with these episodes where I've, some of the ones that I've held so dear to my heart, I, I almost wasn't ready to do it because I'm like, I'm not going to do it justice. And I still feel like that about this episode that I'm like, oh, I fell short, but you just got to you got to just jump off the cliff sometimes. No, and I best. feel like a lot of these topics it's like this isn't going to be the last time we talk about this, right? Like no, I'm there's sure so that we'll much have someone who wants to talk about a specific model or like they want to talk about Artist. like yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a ton of different routes to get here, but for now, before we can dive into anything like that, we do need to get a rudimentary understanding of just the general history of the pinup model before we can really exactly. dive deep later on. <laughs> exactly. And actually, speaking of diving deep, I I did go in this into this with like a specific, okay, you know, generally the pinup models, and it's exactly what you ladies and gentlemen are thinking of, the kind of classic World War II, 1940s calendar girl, pinup girls, um, Going into Betty Page, Betty Grable was one of the most famous, you know, she's an actress, but there's a shot of her in a one um, one piece bikini kind of from the back looking over her shoulder that was one of the most famous pinup photos. And it's um, these photos of these women, both pictures and then the art, um, a lot of artists came up into fame drawing these women and that they be, kind of came the symbolism of war. It was the symbolism of the ideal woman. A lot of the GIs took those pictures with them. They kind of gave them hope, gave them something fun to look at, you know, all these things. And so that's the a main Marilyn Monroe. You know, you start getting into then movie stars who become kind of these ideal realistic pinups. Um, 
But, and I was like, oh, we'll just talk about that. I went down a lovely rabbit hole of the history of them and kind of where it all comes from. And it starts in the 1890s. And we are in the sexual revolution of women. It's, you know, during the suffragette time, women are fighting for their right to vote. It's all these things. And it brought me to the history of the bicycle. What? That's where I'm going to start. I know. Y'all didn't think I was... We're, we're going to talk about the bicycle for a second. And I was just like, I have more... It's It's really interesting. So the bicycle was... First kind of a uh, penny farthing, I believe, was first. It's the the bike with the giant front wheel and the really tiny small back wheel was kind of the first version of the invention. There's all these things. And then you get the bicycle we know today, which is the two same size tires. And those were kind of more fit. At first, it, it was a man's activity. Women weren't really allowed to ride bicycles. They did have tandem bikes and that was more deemed more appropriate because then they're also being chaperoned by a man, all these things. They don't really have full control of the bike. But in these days, um, even horseback riding, women were only allowed to ride side saddle. You know, the women that didn't and actually rode a horse were not looked highly upon and um, it was not very ladylike and not what, but um, so here comes the bike and women are like, well, I want to ride a bike. And they kind of pushed forward and it had a huge feminism movement with it. And there were some pioneer women that became racers and this, that, and they're kind of these like forefront. I was like, Holy shit. I had no idea. Um, But they, it also kind of goes into the clothing. You know, this is the time when they have huge corsets, long dresses and skirts. And so there was a new fashion. It wasn't fully in the street yet, but women started wearing like bicycle pants and bloomers to ride, you know, the serious bikers, but that was not done before. And we owe that to a bicycle, but it's funny. It was very fought against. There's um, an example, like men would in 1895, there was a parody, you know, I love parodies of Mary had a little lamb written by a man. And it goes like this. Dear Mary said the little lamb, it gives me quite a fright to see the girls on bicycles. They're such a novel sight. Why is they all bloomers wear the sight? My blood congeals. Then Mary touched her forehead thus and gentle mum, gently mummer, murmured wheels. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. Which I thought was kind of a fun, like, <laughs> who knew I was going to be nursery? I had to try to do that without like doing a little lamb, little lamb. That was tough. My yeah. brain like, I'm like, I'm uh, listening to all the, and this is the funniest thing is that we're five minutes into discussing this and I'm like, but where are the pinup models? I know. <laughs> and we're talking there. about bicycles. I just, this was so fascinating to me and I had to, uh, this is my last thing about bikes. And then I promise we'll get into um, the first of the pinup girls. Another, this is a side note, kind of doesn't have to do with pinups. It's more just the fascination of this liberation with the bike. But Um, Another concern, like doctors didn't say that it was healthy for women to ride bikes. They said it um, was bad for their overall sexual health. And they believed that bicycles, the bicycle saddle taught that masturbation to women and riding astride anything was seen as too masculine and proper and whatever. But it was written in a medical journal um, about how a bicycle could be used for masturbation. And this is, and I quote, the saddle can be tilted in every bicycle as desired. In this way, a girl could be carrying the front peak of a pompal high or by relaxing the stretched leather in order to let it form a deep hammock-like concavity, which would fit itself snugly over the entire vulva and reach up in the front, bringing about con- constant friction over the clitoris and labia. This pressure would be much increased by stooping forward and warmth generated by vigorous exor- exercise might further increase feeling. And that was their fight about, it's like, this, this is bad, which I was like, it just, there was such a suppression of like, no, like, and they're like, and that's bad for women. They can't, we can't let a woman have an orgasm. Like what? Yeah. Okay. So the bicycle doesn't have that much to do with it, but I just thought it was really interesting. <laughs> and <laughs> listeners, like, she messaged me, she messaged me and she's like, man, you're going to love this. Like I did all this research on the pinup stuff and it stems from bicycles. And I was like, oh boy. And then I'm sitting here. I'm like, this doesn't seem like it's coming back. No, to the it, does, models yet. it does. It does. Okay. Like I, I did trace back into like the history of where this thing came from. And it kind of had a correlation of that was a huge start of, you know, even the bloomers, then you're starting to see a woman's shape and that got Uh, taken into consideration. Yeah. 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 So there's, there we go. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, there's, it all ties back together. You've, you've unlocked Um, it all in my brain. So we get our first pinup artist claimed as Charles Gibson. And in the late 1890s, he created the quote unquote Gibson girl. And the Gibson girls is 
literally now where we're going to root off from the quote unquote ideal girl and it turns into the World War II pinup. But the Gibson girl was the personification of the feminine ideal of physical attractiveness as portrayed by the pen and ink illustrations of artist Charles Gibson during a 20 year span. So the this is a really cool, you know, you still have a, a mix of the classic kind of Victorian era in Gibson's art, but he took from all women. It wasn't like he had this, they all looked the same. He kind of had this idea that like the Gibson girl is everyone and all women in America are beautiful, but it, this is where the hourglass comes in. So he really hones in on these tight corsets that bring in the small waist and give the hourglass shape. And this is the first time we really see it in the ideals of women and this hourglass shape is because of Gibson. (laughs) Fuck, But it's going to change. It's going to change. It's going to change. It was cool. It was also this first time he was a huge uh, women's rights as well activist and loved it, but still loved the beauty of them and kind of married the two, which is what I do love about pinups is that you kind of have this strong female, like he, there's one illustration he wrote, he thought the female sex was superior and, or kind of was in that uh, school of thought with some other men. And there's one drawing he has of three Gibson girls around and they kind of have that big bouffant into a bun with curls falling down and their corsets and they're around a table and one has a magnifying glass looking down. <clears throat> they're all looking down on table and there's a tiny little man on the table. Oh, that's a great, that's kind that, of a, that seems it, like if I was to walk into your apartment, that's the type of artwork I feel like I expect to see on the wall. Yeah. Almost. I <laughs> feel like I would have that. Yeah. I've got, a <laughs> so it wasn't that, you know, it was sexualizing, women necessarily. And this is where, and this still to this day and in the forties and this, that pinups are a little controversial when it comes to women's right feminism, this, that, because on one side of thought and on one side of people, they go, oh, it's, it's liberating. It's celebrating. It's showing how free and strong women are. Again, it's, we're not saying don't masturbate on the bike. That's bad kids. Like it's kind of this, like, no, we (laughs) we deserve and, and this, that, but then on the other side, there's people that think it works against because here we are sexualizing women again, making them an object, making them an item now drawing standards that women cannot actually live up to. And so I fully understand both sides. Obviously I'm fall more on the side of supporting it because I do it. I was going to say, I think that that also is a lot of perception too, in in the sense of like something that you and I have talked about too, like comedy, comedy is so much in the, in the eye of the listener. You know what I mean? And I think that that's the same thing with pinups. If you're looking for it to be like derogatory towards women and, and over-sexualized, then that's what you're going to see. But if you're looking Mm -hmm. at it through the lens of you want it to be this like proud of your body, pro feminism Mm -hmm. thing, you'll see it through that lens too. Like it's, it's very much a thousand percent through the interpretation of the person looking through it. Absolutely. And I think that's your choice. And it's like, you can decide I've even gone through a little side Kelsey tangent, but like I've gone through that dilemma and kind of back and forth myself with, you know, I am an entertainer and a lot of times it is fishnets and G string on stage kind of a thing or modeling myself. It's just kind of, I have this very, it's freeing. I'm strong. I'm proud of my body and this, that. And then some days I will feel like I like, fuck, is that all I am? And I hoard myself out. And so it's, I can, I can choose how I look at things and I've, I've, felt both of them and it's it's a very interesting and like you said yeah comedy is a great example of of that but um this is a quote by charles gibson that i love he he thought american women were the most beautiful and he says um he thought we were only going to get more beautiful and that's right we thanks charles (laughs) complimenting me but he thought due to natural selection of our country in the fact that it's a melting pot will only make future generations more beautiful. And he says, the eventual American woman will be even more beautiful than the woman of today. Her claims to that distinction will result from a fine combination of the best points of all those many races, which have helped to make our population, which I love. He was pro, you know, he realized that what makes America and what like the foundation of the whole country and the idea is that it is where all these different nationalities come to this land, which a lot of people could learn from this right now for fuck's sake. But yeah, 
and that this melting pot of now us all bringing these different races together and mating and making these new, like that will be the most beautiful. And it is. And this is, you know, 1890. I mean, that's pretty. That's really stoked. progressive conversation for 1890. That's a really, the fact that, yeah, I was like, Mr. Gibson, I do say. Um, so, ooh. <laughs> ooh, Mr. Gibson, I like your thought there. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we start. Now we're going to start getting the development and, you know, obviously artists inspire other artists. So that's kind of where we're going to go next is Howard Christie is, these are all American artists and illustrators. And he created the Christie girl, which was a successor to the Gibson girl. And we kind of are passing, I'm going to bounce around a little bit, but the Christie girl um, was really famous into world war one into recruitment loan posters And they started, yeah. So you kind of, I know if I, if you Google Christy girl, you've all seen, you'd be like, okay, that kind of a poster, that kind of thing. Yeah, just even that description, I'm like, okay, I am pretty sure, I'm going to Google it to see right now, but I feel like I already have a perfect image in my head of what you're talking about. You know, you see a lot of the early turn of the century kind of stylistic art where it's like Christy's art was a little more... I know I'm not a, an artist. Or I really know nothing about painting. It's something that I'm just like blown away by and, and just so Martian to me. Um, but watercolory, kind of more soft, blended, pastel y vibes um, is my non artist <laughs> description of it. And I think that's really just kind of a sign of the times as well. That was a very popular style. Anyone that knows art, you're probably like, you are a dumbass. And I am. But <laughs> hey, I'm the one with the microphone here. He kind of comes to, to the front with that. But going back real quick into... Because we're going to kind of bounce between the early 1900s, which does go into World War I. But um, by the late 1800s, the calendar use also comes into play. Well, it was the first time uh, calendars used advertising and put photos in calendars. So um, it was 1903 is the birth of the calendar girl officially. And that's the first time they put a woman on a calendar. And that's a huge, you know, because pinups, pinup calendars is, I used to get one every Christmas. <laughs> My mom would always get me one, but that was a big um, thing. And then it, it goes into kind of propaganda calendars and whatever, but um, that does correlate. So we're starting to get into this. Society is starting to be like, oh, we should put women on everything. And we do get the... Christy girl. And then we're also going to get the Brinkley girl. Um, Nell Brinkley was referred to as the queen of comics. Um, she was an illustrator and comic artist who had like four decades of a career working with New York magazines and newspapers. And she was known for her female characteristics that they kind of were a little bit from the Gibson girl, but she, her girl was more, she's feminine, fun loving and more independent. And so she has, there's a, a, a painting I have or a sketch I have of a drawing she did. And there's one girl and there's like 10 little sketches of her and she's fencing, she's sweeping, she's doing ballet, she's stretching. But this one, you know, she kind of has a 1920s curled bob and one of them, she's bending over and touching her toes and her curls are falling and kind of has this Betty Boopy. Ooh. And even though it's more comic-y and it's supposed to be cute, it's this girl. Th- to me, this is the the most pinup-y, early pinup drawings that I found that I was like, oh, like obviously the Gibson girl, this idea, but she still has any, if you Google Gibson girl, Christy girl, it's kind of, they still have this Victorian era to them. And th- these drawings that I found that um, of the Brinkley girl, I really resonated with like, okay, we're starting to see some, what we, what we'll see in World War II with our pinups. This is, she also drew kind of a more independent, again, it's, Gibson did have this, oh, the woman is superior and strong, but it still kind of fit a little bit into society's, you know, these things just take time. (laughs) You know, when the first pinup is not going to be this, like, I'm doing everything on my own. But then this is really cool. Um, Harry George Peter, known as H.G. Peter, was um, another American illustrator of that time and cartoonist. And he was inspired by Brinkley and often drew like the modern woman, quote unquote, in the turn of the century for newspapers, magazines, and did a lot of that kind of modern woman, um, Art Nueva, again, more stylistically from there. But he is grew to be the illustrator of Wonder Woman. 1941, he creates Wonder Woman. 
Look at that. Yeah, he's not the um, writer of the comics, but he's he's the illustrator. So the image of Wonder Woman we know today is is from him, and he was inspired by Brinkley, which I thought was really cool. And Wonder Woman is a great example. I mean, she comes out in 1941, and that's where we're going to kind of get to in those pinups. And not that Wonder Woman's a pinup, but it coincides with this whole liberation, independence, sex, um, not even sexual, but well, I mean, she's in a cute little leotard, but f- women's independence powerful, and freedom and yeah, strength. Yeah, powerful. And power. And like, yeah. yeah, and it, you know, that kind of, it's the same time we're getting Rosie the Riveter coming in and it it makes sense. And that kind of, it all goes back to the bicycle mat. Yes, because I remember that infamous issue one of Wonder Woman, her powers unlocked when she was riding a bicycle. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I have the original copy. I'm going to bounce to Haddon Hubbard, quote unquote, Sunny Sunbloom was an American artist. He's a Finnish and Swedish descent. And he, in, I think it was 1931, kind of skip the 20s here for a second, but he draws for Coca-Cola. And every single classic Santa Claus Coca-Cola image that you're thinking of right now, that kind of rosy cheeks, he created. So he's responsible for that Santa. And that's a very famous, iconic um, again, you can all Google original Coca-Cola Santa. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And you'll go, oh my God, that's everywhere. But he also drew a lot of women and kind of in that same style of the, again, I don't know what you'd call that style of his art. I, I can see it in my head. I don't know how to describe it. I, I didn't realize how bad I am at <laughs> expressing what an art I just really don't know art at all he is recognized as a huge influence on some of the big pinup artists we get in World War II and so it's kind of his his drawings of the women and his style that he uses was a huge influence on the classic pinup okay so we're gonna move into back to kind of World War One, and I think I did mention this but they started realizing that sex sells and women and pinups and this kind of idea is going to help them with propaganda, join the army kind of things. And so World War One, we start getting a little more of that kind of USA girl. It's still drawn in a little more of an old fashioned way. Um, it's really cool actually to, to look up both, but it's this beautiful, you know, they're, they're using women and they kind of get, they're like, okay, I, you start seeing it more in calendars for it. And so by the time, you know, now the thirties hit and we have full blown, you know, we're in the golden age of Hollywood. So now it's, we have starlets movies and those photographs are, are being taken. And that's one of the most famous photos and pinup is Betty Grable's pinup. That's not until 1943, but she was, you know, we're ending the thirties. Um, that's a little later, but within the golden age of Hollywood and movies and we're, we're getting now women on screen. And so it's just like, everything's just kind of mashing into each other and we're getting unfortunately the idealistic women and sex is starting to be more predominantly shown. And we have done an episode on pre-code Hollywood. If you have not checked it out, go listen to it now. But that was a scandalous time before the golden age of Hollywood. And so it's we're, we're the public is now having these images of women at their fingertips and men have for the first time, you know, with big printing in the early 1900s, women at their fingertips, which again, I could start to say that that's the blame of everything we're going through as women now being like, I have to look a certain way. And, but I kind of love it. But in world war two, so we've already used the propaganda. So now they were fully into world war two and we full throttle are just going to use the girls. And we start getting our most famous um, artists. And one of them is Alberto Vargas. And he creates the Vargas girl. I would say this is arguably my favorite artist. And the Vargas girl, quote unquote, is probably the most idealistic, like classic pinup. And he did a lot. He inspired a lot of the nose art was inspired by kind of Esquire and this, that, and um, him. And and George Petty as well is another really famous artist. But he drew a lot for the Esquire, uh, Ziegfeld Foley's, and eventually Playboy, like way later. Okay, so Vargas even started drawing in the 20s. So he's, you're kind of with his art, what's cool is you can almost see the change of fashion with women, which is something I do love. Like you get a lot of awesome pinups in the twenties and you start, if you go from researching pinups from the twenties into the forties, you get to also watch the change of what the ideal woman looked like and the fashion, the even hairstyles, the 
body types change. So not too much into the drawings, but you do get a bit. It's, you know, in the 20s, I said we had that extreme hourglass body type in the late 1890s. And into the 20s, when now women's dresses are shorter, it's prohibition, they have kind of the more flapper vibe. The boxy boyish figure was more ideal. And it was thin, long and lengthy with no curves, which is completely different than the hourglass shape. And then into the 30s, it's kind of, you know, mix and whatnot. In the 40s, we start getting a little more of that shape back. But what was more in is, you know, we have shoulder pads into our fashion and it's kind of giving that like sharp angled upside down triangle look. And then it's not until the fifties that we really get back into that extreme hourglass shape. Um, and you can see it in a lot of the art and it's really quite awesome. So then I want to go to George Petty is another American pinup who was also, they all fucking drew for Esquire and the same magazines and this, that, but he is very well known for his nose art as well. And so we start getting a lot of that's, you know, it, the women, not just on calendars and in the GI's lockers, but um, they started drawing them on airplanes, which is a very famous and even naming the planes after, you know, whatever the woman is and, and whatnot. So I do love that. So George Petty, I would just, just like just Google these artists if you're at your computer and you're bored and you'll know, you'll be like, I've seen that style before. They're all very similar, but they all have such very artistic differences, which I think is also awesome. And one of my other favorites is Jill Elvgren. He also was an artist. You know, they all kind of just whatever artist this is that. But they all drew through the 1940s and go into the 50s. But so now we can kind of get into – and then we get into the 50s into live pinups and you get the Betty Page, which – I definitely want to do a whole episode on Betty Page. She's fascinating. Yeah. When I said that we were going to eventually do episodes on specific models, I mean, Betty Page. Yeah, and Betty, she's, like. I mean, all <laughs> crazy. And she really gets into the – so a lot of the pinups, it is – they really play into a more innocence of things and kind of give you that. In World War II, it was very USA, I love my country, flying liberty kind of, you know – vibe or it was the everyday girl doing everyday things but ooh, my dress got caught Ooh, i'm trying to change and i got caught and someone's looking through the peephole like very innocent and and whatnot and then you do have the vamp i would say in the late 1930s it's probably the most predominant and hollywood has a lot to do with that but the kind of sultry vamp woman that's lounging with the negligee but there's still something elegant about these women and not saying Betty Page isn't, but she, I want to say comes in with the first kind of S and M vibe. Um, and I know she has, like I said, in her own episode, we can dive into the influence on her, but she plays this girl next door. I don't, Ooh, what's this? And like, Oh, this is fun. But it's like whips and leather and binding and tying up. And so that's kind of a new like whole wave that we get into in the fifties, which wasn't in the forties at all. Like you don't see that extreme of sexual, I don't even know what to call it domination or like, you know, it's, we're not quite there. It's, it's more, it's still, but even the photos that are drawn of like the full nudes, they're so classy and classic and beautiful and sensual. And I do really think, you know, you can just see how the artists viewed women. I think it's a beautiful thing to me. It's, it's not this unrealistic expectation or ideal. I I think it is just this kind of putting on, but having said that and having done pinup modeling because they are drawn, you know, they could kind of tweak things to how they want they did have live models posing and there's a lot of really cool photos of like Alberto Vargas sitting with all these sketches and drawings out and the you can see different variations and there's a girl sitting next to him in a chair that's posing and it's him kind of working and there's there's a lot of really cool photos like that but they they do draw not exactly realistic be it proportions or even poses and that's a lot of the pinup modeling that I've done or with one of my friends I work with we try to replicate exactly pose like like head tilt by head tilt, like exact photos. And some of the poses we have to take in multiple photos and kind of Photoshop them together. He's a genius. But um, because the the poses are not physically possible unless you're either a contortionist or, and, and that's kind of where they can get away with tweaking things with drawing. 
Yeah, it's like the oldie, oldie timesy Photoshop. And that I think is the thing that's interesting is you would imagine it, it's it's such an interesting idea of the fact that we are do you know there are actual women that are showing up to be photographed to then be drawn instead. But I think that if it was just the model, it wouldn't be a thing that people keep looking back to fondly at that point. It would have just been a different type of modeling photo and it would have just kind of faded out. But the fact that it goes that extra step to being drawn by an artist really makes it so memorable and iconic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. We do get a lot of, obviously it moves into the fifties. I kind of stopped at the forties to be honest. And I was more interested with this episode of where it comes from and kind of the inspiration from the bicycle. Um, And I do want to dive in, you know, there's, so many artists like Joyce Ballantyne is an artist and she would use herself a lot as a model, but she, um, in 1959 drew the Coppertone girl that we all know with the girl laying on the beach, getting the, you know, and like, that's so famous. And so it's like, we start then using pinups and seeing pinups into advertising into the fifties and early sixties, which duh. Uh, but there's, there's just so many, so many great artists and so much great work. You know, then it kind of goes into art style too with each of that. And like I said, I'm just really bad with that. They're like, they use more realistic style of painting with it. Um, I don't know. You lost me. <laughs> no, that's, listen, we we just barely scratched the surface. What we need is, we're putting a call out there, obviously. If you are someone who has a ton of experience on the fine art of the drawing side of pinups, like, absolutely, we would love to sit down and talk about that in in an interesting way, but it's not it's not in Gelsey or I's uh, skills <laughs> to, to break I'm, down. You that. know what? I'm good at a lot of things, and I've just come to terms with my life when things like this hit. I'm like, oh, I'm just not good at it, and oh well. <laughs> <laughs> so fine. yes, if that sounds like you, contact us. Join us now. We want you. Hey, do you have an idea for a podcast but don't know where to start? Or do you have an already existing podcast that you want to take to the next level? Well, check out WeKnowPodcasting.com. From concept development to theme music to editing to logos, WeKnowPodcasting.com is a one-stop shop for all things pod. Don't hesitate to hit us up. We're very nice. So, Gelsey, right near the end of this episode, we kind of put out a call for, hey, if you've ever done art for pinup work, like we want to talk to you. But there's something else that I think would be really fun for us to talk about that we haven't quite covered yet. And I would love to bring on an expert in the field to talk to us. How would you feel if we did an episode on burlesque dancing? Oh, absolutely. Because I, as you were talking about the pinup girls things, I was thinking that they do go weirdly hand in hand in a, in a certain way. Like They do. And a little bit of the crossover, and I forgot to mention this in the episode actually, was you know in the early 1900s into more of the 20s and 30s that a lot of burlesque clubs were opening and whatnot. And they had advertisements and kind of calling cards for the show and for girls. And a lot of those were also some, – some historians and sites will quote that as kind of the first idea of pin up because they would take those advertisements, the guys and pin them up on their wall. I mean, that's where the whole term pin up comes from is, is that, but um, it came from kind of the theatrical side and advertising burlesque. And so it does really does go hand in hand. And then I mentioned Betty page a little bit, and she is also not just one of the most iconic pin up models and girls, but she also is considered a kind of godmother of burlesque. And there is a show, um, a movie, Is it? I think it's called Teaserama or Stripperama. Anyways, it doesn't matter. She had these different movies that were kind of, what? what's the name of um, those films when they're kind of underground and you get the- Like a Grindhouse movie? Mm, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. I think Grindhouse. These were considered dirty films in the early 50s. And it, they are burlesque. It's just literally her coming out and doing a strip tease. And then there's there's quite a few um, women in these films and they come out and they're, they're kind of awful. I've, I've seen one of them and, and these, they're really not that great. And Betty Page is, she's so damn cute. But even these like little dance moves she's doing, you're like, what the hell is going on? That was kind of, you know, she's a pinup and then starts this burlesque movement, if you will. And it is Teaserama that I'm thinking of. And there's some other famous burlesque performers. Anyways, Betty Page is kind of a, a huge influence. Burlesque already existed, but making it what it, kind of how we know it today. So there is definitely a crossover and I definitely want to do 
a burlesque episode. All right. Well, if you think that you're the person to talk about burlesque with us, uh, there's a bunch of different places to reach out. And there's also a bunch of places if you just want to tell us some of your fun bicycle facts. Gelsey, where can they go to tell us any of that? Please tell us on Instagram. You can find us at before my time underscore podcast or on Facebook. Just type in before my time. and We will pop up. Let us know if you're an expert on burlesque. Let us know about your experience on a bicycle. Actually, maybe keep that to yourself. But um, we are so thankful that you guys tune in every week to listen to us. Love you so much. You are why I keep doing these crazy rants. And maybe to show some love back, it'd be awesome if you could leave us a review or um, just throw some stars. That is how we get seen and found so I can reach more people to talk their ears off. Love you all. Bye. Listening to the Geekscape Network. 